You're listening to an audio resource from Redemption Hill Church. This resource is not meant to be a replacement for participation at a local church, but an accessory to the care you're receiving from your own pastors. To learn more about Redemption Hill Church or to give to our ministry, visit redemptionhilldsm.org. You may be seated. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you. Good to see your faces. Thanks for worshiping this evening, this afternoon. Um, as you know, we're in our sermon series, United in Christ. Just a reminder of kind of the thematic things going on here in the book of Ephesians. Um, we've seen that indeed, if you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only united to Christ, but we are united to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, again, one more reminder, we go through books of the Bible because God has spoken and continues to speak through his word. Like sometimes that means actually going really slow and looking at all the words. Call that expositional preaching. And so one of the goals of, of this moment is for you not to hear as much from Sean Powers, but to hear from God. That's, what I, that's who I want you to hear from. Therefore, we approach God's word, hopefully eagerly, ready, and, and willing to hear. So I know Rob just prayed. I'm just going to pray briefly and ask for help from the Spirit. And so, God, that is my desire in this moment, is the Spirit that is indeed at work in me and in other brothers and sisters in this room. I pray you'd give us all teachable hearts. We want you, O oh God, to speak to us through your word. It's for our good. We, we believe and we know it's for our good and it's for your glory. Amen. Deficits are challenging to overcome. Deficits. Uh, we see in sports how deficits are difficult to overcome. If you watch sports, you know what I'm talking about. Some games are so lopsided that there's a point in the game when, when the coach takes out all the starting players and puts in all the backups. So, so growing up, I was that backup. <laughs> I got to play when things were really bad. <laughs> when a team plays from a deficit in sports, two things are working against the losing team. The first thing is the score, obviously. If the Iowa Hawkeye basketball team is beating the Iowa State Cyclones, which is a common thing in the state, let's say it's 80 to 50, <laughs> uh, that's, qu that's quite a score to overcome in the game. 30 points. That's a, that's a lot of points in a basketball game to overcome. Also, time is working against the losing team. There will be a point when the final buzzer will sound and the game will be over. The closer the game moves to the final buzzer, the more difficult it is for the team to overcome the deficit. So in this life, in this life right now, as we breathe and as you sit and as you watch and listen, in this life, everyone in this room, or if you're watching online, is moving toward the final buzzer. So what we need to sort out is what can be done about the deficit. Finances are another practical example of some people trying to overcome deficit. Let's say you go to college and you take out a loan, let's say a $100,000 loan, you know, when you're all said and done, that's the kind of like, that's what you owe Uncle Sam if you took, you know, federal loans out. After you graduate school, you are working from a deficit. And the goal is hopefully to pay off the deficit. Many people who graduate with student loan debt can testify that it is difficult to overcome the debt. Depending on a person's financial situation, it could take up to 20 years plus to pay it all back. So whether it's a basketball game or personal finances, trying to overcome a deficit takes work. It's not impossible, but it takes work. Spiritually speaking, you are working from a deficit from the day you were born into this world. And here's the deal about the spiritual deficit in your life. No matter how hard you try, you cannot overcome the deficit. Ephesians 2 tells us about the spiritual deficit in your life. And it also tells us how the deficit can be overcome. Remember, I just said you can't overcome the spiritual deficit in your life. And if you can't do it, the question becomes, who can? Who can do it? 
In a previous sermon, I explained that there is a logical pattern at work in Ephesians 2, in in particular in chapter 2. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, we read about a person's life without or before knowing God. If you are a Christian, you were, past tense, a child of wrath. If you are not a Christian, you remain a child of wrath. Why? Because your sin is outright rebellion against a holy and good God who created you. Your sin and rebellion against God keep building the deficit. Without God, every sin you commit compounds on top of all the other sins you have committed. Your deficit before God because of sin is greater than America's current financial deficits. It's a lot. (laughs) Whatever that number is, seems to be really high these days, your sin is more. However, so that was verse 1 to 3, right? Several weeks ago. Then we got to verse 4. Verse 4. Remember those two words? But God... Like the conjunction, but, but God. We read God breaks in and redeems children of wrath and transforms a child of wrath into a son or daughter. So in in between verses 4 to 10, that was last week, we see that the heart of, we see the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We read, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And guess what? There is nothing a person can do to save themselves. Salvation is 100% a gift from God. Verse 8 of Ephesians 2. You cannot muster up the faith to believe God. Faith to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gift from God. You don't give gifts to yourself, generally speaking. Maybe some of you do that. If you're not supposed to do it that way, the gift actually comes from someone else. This gift comes from God. Because Jesus died on a cross for you and your sin, your sin deficit, again, greater than the national debt, that sin deficit has been erased. And you have been forgiven. If you believe in what Christ has done, then someone at the bank went into your account and not only erased the debt, but they're like, you know what? We are going to put an excessive amount of money into this person's savings account. So two things happened. The debt was erased, and God's like, you know what? All those spiritual blessings that I talked about in Ephesians 1, those are yours as well. And now you live in your life in the black because of Jesus. So Ephesians 2 begins by giving you the bad news, right? It's the news that you need to know about. But it's like, man, I got really got to reconcile and talk about what's going on with my sin. And then verse 4 to verse 10, we read the good news. By grace, you've been saved through faith. And now in verse 11, we pivot back to the bad but sobering news of a person's life without God. The difference between the bad news of verses 1 to 3 and this passage is that previously God wants to make sure you understand the consequences of sin. Like, we read that over and over, sins and trespasses. Can't read Ephesians 1 to 3 without that guy just hitting you in the face. Man, I'm a sinner. God hates sin, and God needs to deal with sin. In today's passage, sin is not the primary focus. There are other factors Jesus had to overcome to make you a son or daughter of the Most High God. Other factors. The deficit Jesus had to overcome is actually more significant than you may realize. I'll say it another way. If your view of the gospel is only that you have been forgiven of your sin, then you do not understand the power nor the depth of the gospel to save. Think of it this way. When you read a novel, uh, usually there's like a, a major overarching theme. But connected to that theme are other plot lines 
that help make sense of that theme, help support that theme. And those other plot lines, those other themes that are kind of underneath that major theme are, are still important. God dealing with sin is the major theme in the Bible, but there are additional factors in play. Back to finances for a moment, and then we're going to start getting into the text. Let's say you are a business owner, and there comes a point when your product is no longer relevant and the economy sinks like a rock. Think like 2008, right? If you're a private business owner, that was a rough time. You take out a loan from the bank to cover your bills. Over time, the debt became a massive boulder sitting right on top of your back. You see the interest that the bank has charged you for the loan. And then you come to a point when you realize the deficit is too significant. Outside of a miracle, you cannot overcome the deficit. Here's the deal. The debt isn't because of sin as much as it is circumstance. You just kind of dealt a bad hand at the moment. In Ephesians 2, 11 and 12, there are two aspects in which a person is working from a deficit. There, is a, there are circumstantial deficits Jesus had to overcome. Jesus had to overcome, first, a religious deficit, and then second, a spiritual deficit. And I know they seem similar, but I'm actually parsing them out. Again, we already saw that Jesus needed to overcome a deficit created because of sin, but now we see there is more to the story. So here's the bottom line. If you are not a Jew, which I think is all of you in this room, (laughs) if you're not a Jew, Jesus had to overcome and fulfill certain aspects of Judaism, in particular the law, so that Gentiles, I'm thinking all of you and me, could be fully welcomed into the family of God. In uh, 2007, Shreese and I moved to the South so that I could attend seminary, uh, North Carolina in particular. Southern folks are friendly. Um, They're nice. But, (laughs) I got Southern friends. It did not take long for, for us to realize that others knew we were not from the South. And we found it challenging to be accepted into certain southern circles. Even church life there was just a different culture. We, had a, we just had a difficult time feeling accepted and, and making you know, lasting friendships there. And maybe that's on us a little bit. But there was certainly a cultural aspect in play that we just couldn't, we couldn't break through. There were barriers we found difficult to overcome so that we could be accepted. What I hope you see by the time I'm done this afternoon is that the power of the gospel to save, like I said earlier, is more than you could ever imagine. The gospel breaks down barriers you never knew existed. (laughs) Part of the point of this passage and it's a dominant theme in the New Testament is that God invites all kinds of people into his church family. God invites all sorts of people working from similar deficits into his church. You don't have to be from a particular part of the world speaking a specific language, having a specific culture to be invited into God's family. You just need to have faith that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Okay, the text. First, let's see the religious deficit Jesus overcame so that you could be included into his family. Take a look at verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles, so you sitting out there, you Gentiles, I don't see any Jews in here or former Jews in terms of religion. You Gentiles, We're in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. What in the world does circumcision have to do with God saving you? I mean, circumcision seems like a strange way for God to enter into a covenant or an agreement with people. Couldn't they all just get tattoos? Seemed like an easier way to go about things. I would have opted for the tattoo. If you give me the two options, I'll take the tattoo. 
Well, in the Old Testament, circumcision is a sign of God's covenant with Abraham and his people. Here's Genesis 17, which actually gives us some context of what Paul is referring to in verse 11. Here it is. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my, there's that word, covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me, you, and your offspring after you. Every male, ladies, you're off the hook. Congratulations. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Like these guys were adults at the time. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and that shall be the sign of the covenant between you and me. Since Genesis 17, circumcision has become a Jewish religious practice. And it might seem strange God would choose this practice to set his people apart. But God knew what he was doing. God knew circumcision is ultimately harmless, and he also knew circumcision is going to set Israel apart from all the other nations that they were surrounded by. In the Old Testament, the sign of circumcision signifies that God is yours and you are God's. And in the New Testament, the Gentiles... All these folks in Ephesus, they were not circumcised. And the question on the table is, should the Christians follow the Jewish Jewish practice of circumcision? And the answer is no, and here is why. The shift from the Old to the New Testament is a move from the external to the internal. Now, there is no doubt about it. God has always wanted his people to trust him. For example, Abraham was commended of being a man of faith. But the emphasis of works shifts from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Instead of external circumcision, the focus is now on a spiritual circumcision of the heart. Romans 2 clarifies that circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit. Romans 2 verse 29. So go ahead and just like put the knife down. <laughs> here's, here's the point Paul is trying to make to the Ephesian church in verse 11. All the Gentile dudes do not need the knife. They were not a part of God's Old Testament covenant. But guess what? Jesus has overcome the religious practice. Because Jesus has fulfilled the ritual aspects of the law, you no longer need to receive circumcision. Now, guys, you might have been circumcised for health reasons, but there's no need to be circumcised for spiritual reasons. I got saved in my 20s, and I praise God for the change. Instead, by faith, by faith, God invites you into his covenant when your heart is transformed and you've been reconciled. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ not only atones for your sins, again, verses 1 to 3, but it puts a stop to these Jewish rites. Why? So that people from all nations, all tribes, all tongues can be reconciled to God. The second religious aspect Jesus overcame is read in verse 12. It says, you were, quote, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. The word alienated has a sense of estrangement. If you are a Christian, there was a point when you were never part of God's family, right? If you are not a Christian, you are not a part of God's family at present. you kind of been estranged. There's undoubtedly an, an ethnic vibe in this particular phrase. The word commonwealth is used to emphasize citizenship. Like you're all you know, citizens of the United States, for example. So pulling it all together, there was a point in your life, Christian, when you were not a part or a citizen of God's country. God's country is in Iowa, even though Iowa is the place that comes closest to resembling God's country, in my opinion. No, citizenship into God's country is to be a part of God's people and receive all the privileges that that accompany being a part of God's people. So like an example, like over the years, I have worked out at various gyms, right? Um, And in many respects, gyms can be a community of people who act like a family. I see it all the time. I've been a part of the YMCA, Lifetime Fitness years ago, Planet Fitness. 
et cetera. When you, when you join a gym, you receive all the benefits of the gym, including the relational aspects of what's going on. When you are a part of God's family, you receive all the privileges and all the benefits. When you are a citizen of God's country, the church members in Ephesus could identify with being alienated from a country. Remember, during this time, so first century, during this time, this letter was written when the Romans ruled the region. They were in charge. They were the authority. The church in Ephesus would have been made up of a bunch of Greeks. Greeks could not be a citizen under Roman rule. They had no rights under Roman law. They were foreigners in their own land. So the church in Ephesus knew what it was like to be alienated. There was a stretch in my life when I traveled overseas on a regular basis. Um, church planning certainly slowed that down. I mean, I say overseas, I mean like going to all kinds of places all around the world. And when you are a person who speaks another language, you have different skin color, you have different culture. When you are in another country, you are keenly aware that you are different. The differences are not bad, but you just simply know you're different. When I spent time in Afghanistan, I, I realized how different I was on every level. Every box that could explain the differences between me and another Afghan, it could be checked unless I was talking with uh, another male. So was I a foreigner in Afghanistan? In every sense of the word, yes, I was a foreigner and I knew it. No one had to tell me I was a foreigner. All my senses told me. Through the cross, Jesus brings near a person who is alienated. Jesus brings near the foreigner. Jesus overcomes that deficit. In this particular case, this religious deficit. Jesus overcomes the religious and ethnic barriers which create separa separation. I mean, one of the main things we need to see here is Jesus is always greater than the barrier. Always. Some of the time, no. Part of the time, no. Always greater. The third way God overcame a religious deficit for the Gentiles is to include them into God's covenant. Gentiles were, again in verse 12, Strangers, which is very similar to that word alienated, which also can be said as foreigners. Strangers to the covenants of promise. Okay, what does Paul mean by covenants of promise? Well, when you read the Old Testament, you see God makes covenants with his chosen people. A covenant is a contract or agreement. Earlier, we saw how God made a covenant or agreement with Israel through the practice of circumcision. This is called the Abrahamic Covenant. In the book of Exodus, we read about the Mosaic Covenant, and there are multiple covenants throughout the Old Testament. So what does all this mean for the Gentiles? It means, because of Jesus, they're no longer strangers to God's covenant, but they're well acquainted with the ways of God because God has brought them near. Here's an example of what's going on. Let's say you begin a new job. For you to be successful at your new job, you need to understand the company you work for. So what do you do? You, you like read the company manual. You do the Google search. All right, I'm working for them. How, how do I get to know them better? You, you go to your boss, your new boss, and you ask good questions like, help me understand the culture here. You take a vested interest in the place you are a part of. Now, you were hired for the job, and as a result, you have access to all the info to be successful at your job. Ephesians 2.12 tells us that the covenants of God are no longer hidden from the Gentiles, but they have been made clear to all the Gentiles who believe God by faith. In the Old Testament, God chose Israel as his people to display his glory. Now God's people are from all ends of the globe. But the end goal is the same. 
God's people are display are to display God's glory. I think it's worth quoting Jeremiah 31 at, a, at length, which explains what God is up to when we talk about the differences between you know, these covenants in the Old Testament and what God is doing here in Ephesians 2. It says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenants that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them uh, took them by the hand <laughs> to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Think Exodus here. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Verse 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them before it was written on tablets. But something new is going to happen. I will put it within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. I mean, this is, this is pushing us forward to the new covenant where Jesus is the one who forgave sin through his death. The way God makes his covenant of grace known is by writing the covenant on the heart. How do you know you belong to God? How do you know? You know it right here. You know the transformation that has taken place in your life. Because of God. So all of that is a bit of how God has overcome through Christ the religious deficit you had apart from knowing God. But in addition to the religious deficit, Christ overcame the spiritual deficit. Here's verse 12. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, having no hope. I mean, let that land on you. What was your life before Christ? You had no hope. None. No hope. And you were without God. To be separated from Christ means to be separated from Christ. <laughs> it's fairly straightforward. I mean, consider the closest earthly relationship you've ever had. What feelings have you had when you were separated from that person? Every time I get on a plane to leave Des Moines, I instantly feel separated from my wife and kids. It's a, it's a physical separation for sure, but it's also like this hole in my heart. I, I immediately become homesick. I just, I just want to be with my wife and my kids. Like every time, I, I, I promise you, every time that plane leaves the tarmac, I'm sending a text to my wife and saying, I miss you already. Well, every person who has ever existed feels homesick if you are separated from Christ. You feel homesick because sin and rebellion have separated you from Christ. You feel homesick because of the religious and spiritual barriers. At every turn, people try to fill the void that exists in the soul because of sin. No one wants to feel homesick. Some people turn to entertainment to overcome separation, but that's not adequate. Some people turn to food to overcome separation. Some people turn to substance. Some people turn to relationships to overcome separation. Some people ignore the separation between that person and God altogether. Let's just ignore it. Let's just pretend it's not there. And the list goes on. And the desire to overcome the separation should not be surprising. If God has created every person in his image... Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And if every person has a sin nature, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23, then there will be an eternal acknowledgement of the distance between a person and their creator. The question becomes, how does a person overcome the distance? Or, as I, as I have been saying in this sermon, how does a person overcome that deficit? I'll answer the question in a moment. But the separation between a person and Jesus leads to the obvious conclusion. Without Christ, 
you are without hope and without God. The word hope in the Bible is often misunderstood. The Greek word for hope in the Bible is more like eager expectation. It's the word elpis in the Greek. I mean, it's eager expectation. Paul does not have a hope that is fickle, but that is factual. That's what you need to know about hope in the Bible. It's a facts-based hope. The hope Christians have is a future grounded in the facts of past events. The future hope for Christians is that one day God will restore and redeem the sinful and evil world. Jesus will come back. The future hope of Christians is grounded in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ rose from the dead, then Christians have every reason to hope in God. In other words, past, past performance doesn't just predict future behavior. In this case, past performance ensures future behavior. That's the kind of hope Christians have. God always follows through on his promises. And if God has promised to return all the rights, he will right all the remaining wrongs. If he has promised to do that, then he will do that. And Christians have an eager expectation of God because of his promises. I mean, the, the world has cheapened the idea of hope. Right? I, I think you would agree when you kind of test the biblical hope toward kind of how we use it in our everyday you know, phraseology and terminology. We've just kind of cheapened it. Worldly hope is fickle and disappoints. You may hope for a raise at work that never comes. You may hope for a specific present at Christmas, but you never receive it. You may hope in a relationship that eventually lets you down. You hope for good health until the heart attack hits. We tend to place our hope in temporal things when God wants us to look up for a lasting and eternal hope. Without faith in Jesus, hope in this world will continue to disappoint you. But if you trust Jesus with your entire life, you will see that the deficit is overcome. And not only overcome, but your fickle hope is replaced. Your fickle hope, this is what you have now, Christian, is a faith-filled, factual hope. Faith-filled, factual hope. I made that up on my own. Couldn't do that. But I tried. Faith-filled, factual hope. That's what you have. That's what you can bank on. It's incredible. It is incredible. All Jesus overcame for you, Christian. Like, let it sink. Let it land on you. Because of Jesus, you no longer need to be physically circumcised, guys. But a spiritual circumcision of the heart takes place for everyone. Because of Jesus, you are no longer alienated from God's people, but you are a son or daughter of a loving and gracious father. Because of Jesus, the covenant made with Israel are yours, the spiritual Israel, the church. Because of Jesus, the distance has been overcome. Because of Jesus, you now have a lasting an eternal hope. How is all this possible? Many of you obviously know, but this is the beauty of Ephesians 2. In the next verse, which is going to be the bridge to the sermon for next week, we read this, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, you've been brought near. By the blood of Christ. It's, it's like this picture just comes in my head that when God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, regenerates a person, when he regenerated you, it's like you were miles away and all of a sudden you just, you're right there. With your gracious and loving Father. 
And I think for Christians, I think for you all, that's one thing you just have to remember. God is not far off from you. Because of Christ, he is near and he has brought you near. we got to remember these precious truths. It says here in this passage, in verse 13, you were brought near by the blood of Christ. Blood is a powerful image in the Bible. When blood is taken out of any living being, the life is taken away, right? It's pretty obvious. I was recently reminded of the importance of a person's blood in a very um, traumatic situation. Uh, several months ago, my father-in-law was rushed to the hospital because of, a, because of the massive blood that he had lost. I won't explain the entire story, but I learned that he had to undergo three blood transfusions. Those transfu transfusions saved his life. Blood rushed out of Jesus when he died on the cross. There was no medical doctor present to provide the blood transfusion. Jesus died on mission and with purpose. Jesus died to forgive you of your sin. Jesus died to bring you near to God. And Jesus died to overcome the circumstantial deficits that you once had in your life. And to show the world, and to show the world that Jesus had power over death and sin and all these circumstances, the sinless Savior of the world rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. God has brought you near. He has brought you near. It's for your good. It's for the honor and glory of his great name. If you believe all this by faith, then you are a child of a good and gracious Heavenly Father. Let's pray. You're listening to an audio resource from Redemption Hill Church. This resource is not meant to be a replacement for participation at a local church, but an accessory to the care you're receiving from your own pastors. To learn more about Redemption Hill Church or to give to our ministry, visit redemptionhilldsm.org.